pray for the families of those who were wounded and who are going to survive, but survive with scars. We pray for those who were just in the building and may be emotionally scarred because they've lost friends or family, coworkers. They've watched this thing repeated over and over in their head and they asked the question, why am I still here? Lord, we pray for each and every person that's been affected by this senseless act. And we pray that somehow, Lord, the only way you can do it is to bring them closer to you through this event. May they have people in their lives who know you and know your loving grace. You, the great healer, God, we pray specifically this morning. I want to pray for my friend Amanda as she recovers. And I want to pray for her family as they're by her side. Father God, we know without a shadow of a doubt that this means today, above all days, that, that you are coming soon. There is no one safe, Lord, for the wrath of Satan, except for the safety that we find in our relationship with you. Be with us now, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. I have a few last announcements that I want to bring to your attention. Tomorrow there is a baby shower for Angela Atkins Long and for Angela and James. They're expecting a boy that will be here at, um, sorry, that'll be at, uh, at 5 p.m. at Barb's house. Barb and Larry's house, well, you know. It's Barb's house, we know. <laughs> and see, look at the bulletin for further details on that event. Next week, uh, next Friday night and next Sabbath, we have, uh, for the youth and young adult community, we have a huge program going on. For the last year or so, we've been having a program called Faith, Hope, Love, which meets on Friday nights. It's been an evangelistic tool to the community. This next Friday night and Sabbath, Faith, Hope, Love will be here at Camelback. Friday night in the Rotunda, we'll have a, a, a special Vespers program. Sabbath morning during Sabbath School and Church, we'll have a special Sabbath School and Church program. And then next Sabbath afternoon, for those of you who have never heard of Samaritan's Feet, Pastor Ben coordinates this very large outreach to our community where we give shoes away to needy kids. This year, they're combining shoes and toys. And so we'll be giving those things away to needy children. If you would like to take a part of that program, if you'd like to be a part of that, please uh, go online or you can call, contact me and, and sign up to be a part of that program. Part of the Samaritan's Feed program is kids coming to this facility downtown. We're able to sit down with them. We pray with them, we wash their feet, we give them a brand new pair of socks, we give them a brand new pair of shoes. Some of these kids have never had a pair of shoes and have never had to share. So this is a huge blessing that we're able to be a part of with the Arizona Conference and some other organizations here in town. If you want to be a part of it next Sabbath afternoon, let me know, we'll get you signed up. We need some more hands and we need some more prayers. At this time, as we begin, I'm going to invite my friends, the Garcias, to come up. Christ was born just as God had promised. God's people in other times waited and trusted in that promise. Our hope in, is in Christ who comes into our hearts and promises to return. Faith says we can trust God who keeps his word. We light this candle to remind us that God that our hope and faith are in him. Amen. Romans 10, verse 13 through 17. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. 
Our Father, our God, and our King, Lord, we come to you this morning in worship. We pray for the sounds of music. We pray for the word that will be brought to us. We pray for the hope that we can only find in you and our relationship in you, Lord. Bless us now as we enter this special time. In we pray. Amen. Why don't you swing, swing down, chase up and let let's me ride. Swing, swing down, chase up and let me ride. Rock me, Lord, rock me, Lord. Calm and easy. I got a home on the other side. Why don't you swing, swing down, chase up and let's me ride. Swing, swing down, chase up and let's me ride. Rock me, Lord, rock me, Lord. 
Are we good? Yes, we're good. Um, just a couple of things. You'll notice, um, according to your bulletin, some of the orders of songs are different. This is because we had to make some last minute changes due to an injury that took place with one of the individuals in Abella Menti. I'm sure you can't figure out who that is when they get up there. Um, she would be embarrassed if I said anything about it. So, you know, um, anyway, so we, we had to rearrange some things. And um, the first number we did, Swing Down Chariot, I just wanted to mention that the soloist was Lily, and it was not in the bulletin, and I didn't want her to go by unrecognized. And also the soloist on Ride on King Jesus is not in the bulletin either. That's my fault, nobody else's, and that's Melina. Um, and that's what we're going to do now, is Ride on King Jesus. About the Latin on Lux Eterna. I just so that you understand um, what we're singing about. Eternal light. And it's just inviting the eternal light to shine down on us and bring us peace. So very appropriate for this season, but also throughout our lives, that that eternal light of God will come down and bring us that eternal peace.
good choir has an even better accompanist. And this year I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I'd really prayed to the Lord uh, because the one I'd had for three years was graduating at the end of last year. It's like, okay, now what do I do? It's always a tra traumatic experience. And God sent me Emmanuel. Through his sister, God sent me Emmanuel. <laughs> and he is just doing a fantastic job. But on this piece, it has piano duet accompaniment. So we have our brother and sister team, Emmanuel and Vanessa, playing um, on the company went for Hark I Hear the Harps Eternal.
All righty. Got to open this up. For those of you who've not seen oops, what we're doing for backpacks, this is the backpack that we're going to be giving away this year. It's the same one from last year. Um, we'll have this out in the lobby. But there is something very specific I wanted to talk to you about this year about this backpack. Uh, for some reason, I can't figure out. It's childproof because I can't open it. Um, yes, yes, yes. Jackie with the jokes, I know. All right, what do you, uh, first of all, I have four trusted um, assistants with me this morning. Okay, there we go. Woo. I have four trusted assistants with me this morning. For those of you who were not here last week, Camelback Church has a program called Backpacks for Christ. So on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we'll be giving 1,200 of these backpacks away to needy families and homeless in our community here in Phoenix. This is a blessing because all the funds that are raised for this pro project come out of this congregation. This is not an easy program to do, or, and it was not something that any of us, I, it was started way before I got here, but there are specific things that happen in this program. Number one, I'm gonna grab that from you. Bailey, what do you have in your hands currently? Oh, wait, yeah, I gotta give you the microphone. Speak loud. A basket. A basket. And on the outside of that basket, there is a, a sign. What does that sign say? To help give donations. What kind of donations do we want? Maybe, let's see here. And, and one of the things we do is we fill these little plastic baggies here with donations. Say like, uh, what do you have there, uh, Jackson? Well, we have some soap, shampoo, conditioner, and a shower cap. And where, uh, let's just say, put those right in here. Huh, is that, does that look like enough stuff? What, what would you do, if you were homeless, what would you do with soap? Wait, wait, do you soap now? <laughs> He's gonna get me later. He's gonna get me later. Can, can you hold on to that baggie for me? Uh, see that look? See that look? I'm, I'm gonna get it later. Now, uh, uh, you on the end, you have, uh, you have something in your hands. What is that? A Bible. A Bible? Do we put, we put a Bible in that backpack? Now, for those of you who don't know, last year, God blessed us with uh, having a, a church member that donated all the Bibles that we needed in both English and Spanish for this program. Amen. Um, and so we give a Bible away. And why, why would be giving a Bible to the homeless people? It's important that the homeless people have a re relationship with God and know his word. Um, good script. Now, let me ask you this. Do you believe that? Yes. Do you really? Yes. Okay, you're saying it with conviction. Yes. Yes. We do believe that. We believe that, that, that the word of God is the reason that we do this. The other thing that we give away in this, for those of you who don't know, is we give away steps to Christ. Now, I forgot to bring up the steps to Christ. Jackson, you're still giving me the evil eye. I can't deal with it. I can't deal. You're, 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 I'm afraid. I, I, can you sit in front of me in church and not behind me? I don't know what's going to happen. Anyway, so let's, let's put that in there. Let's, let's put the Bible in there. Let's put that in there. Now, you have a blanket? How many of you know that, now we're not giving away blankets this year per se, but someone in this congregation, Gwen Darcy, someone in this congregation knits, crochets, makes, hat, knits, thank you Gwen, uh, hats for us to give away. Not 100, that'd be nice, not 200, not 300, not 400, 500 hats for us to give away to the people in need. I, I, first of all, I found out it takes her eight hours to make one. It would take me eight weeks to make one. And I'm not even sure that one of, in, in, after those eight weeks it would be totally in, in a circle that would be on someone's head. That's the kind of dedication we have of people who are committed to this program. But we're going to throw that right in there. Put that right in there. All right. Stuff it in there. Stuff it in there. Don't worry. Now, the thing I want to point out to you is if, if for some reason you happen to not know where you're going to sleep at tonight, this would not just be a backpack. This would be your library. This would be your church. 
This would be everything that you need. This would be your, 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 your carry-on bag. This would be everything. So if you think that, that, that what we're doing here is nothing, this is everything to someone. And for those of us who have everything, I, I think that we need to second, be second thinking about what we really are doing. Um, one of the things I like to do is whenever I travel, now I need one of the guys because it's going to get really heavy. Okay, why don't you hold, can you hold the, the basket for her, please? I'm going to give that to you, and I want you to just pour those in there. One of the things that I like to do when I travel is I take all the hotel shampoo, soap that I can find. I'm not ashamed. I paid for it. Not that I can find, I mean, out of, out of my room, not out, of, not out of someone else's room, out of my room. Watch out, watch out. Woo, I got to correct that. Okay, so what I like to do is I take it and I put it in a bag and I save it just for this purpose. Now, I know it's a little late for you, but there is a list of things. And for those of you who have kids at TCE, our kids at TCE are going to be participating in this program. So you'll see these white baskets out in front of TCE. We're going to do eight days of giving where we need sample size soap, Shampoo. By the way, someone has already donated a couple of hundred things of toothpaste. Um, we need soap, shampoo, deodorant. You'll see the list. The list is also in your, um, it should be a handout. Uh, we also, and I, I, I'm going to brag on this. She's not here, so I can do this. Someone has already brought, came up with a brilliant idea that I never even thought of that we needed to give away toilet paper. That to me was a stroke of genius. I never thought about that. But someone has already purchased 500 rolls of toilet paper for us to give away. Um, yeah, you can clap for that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Listen, I know that I know for a fact that uh, some of these folk up here are going to be involved in this program on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. This is not about us <clears throat> more mature people. If we're gonna change the world, it has to start here. It has to start with these, it has to start with our feet, it has to start with every part of our bodies. Our goal, for those of us who are settled in our relationship with God, our goal is to give those who are learning who Jesus Christ is and what he's about, give them wings and to give them the opportunity to do everything that they can do to share the gospel with the world. I want to ask you to continue to participate in this program. After church, there will be signups for our five locations. Um, there'll be a, a, someone out, out on the table with the signups. Come be a part next week. We have two more weeks of giving. Uh, the bas baskets will be here all week. Thank you, very able helpers. Uh, sir, would you mind taking that basket out for me, out to the lobby, and, uh, and just put, place it out there for me, and you guys can have a seat. Thank you very much. It's a time of service when we want to prepare our hearts and minds as we come to the Lord in prayer. If you're able, uh, feel free to kneel or, just, or bow your, your hearts. Dear Lord, we come to you today with a heart full of thanksgiving. We've just finished that season. And we've moved into the Advent season. And so we're so thankful for this opportunity to think about you, renew our commitment to the plan of salvation and your plan. Lord, we're so thankful for the beautiful weather outside. It's just a gorgeous day. And we're so thankful to hear the news of the Pulavati family last night, the new life that's come into our, our family. Lord, we're so thankful for the music this morning and the, the hands that, and the voices that lift praise to you. We know there's members of our family that um, need special help. Their bodies are not the way you designed them. And maybe their, their hearts are broken. Lord, we lift them up to you. And we pray that they feel your presence. As Jackie said earlier, we pray for those families in San Bernardino who are going to have a different kind of Christmas this year and we lift them up to you in a very special way. We pray a blessing on our speaker today and that the, his words are your words that reach out to us. 
thank you for the opportunity to worship you in this beautiful place. And today, Lord, we ask that our hearts and our minds and our words and our actions bring glory to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. I keep hoping they make a Bible for my phone that when I turn to a scripture, it'll rustle like it has pages. But in case you have a real one, we're reading from John 17, 3. We're reading in the NIV version, and it's on your screen in front of you. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Good morning, everyone. Time for our tithes and offerings this morning. Always at the end of the year, we always have to tell you how far we're behind. Well, I think it's some $50,000 or something like that to the budget. I'm going to tell you right now that I'm not going to be up here to beg you for your money so you can relax. But I am thankful for so many who week by week, month by month, are experiencing their relationship with their Lord by giving their tithes and their offerings. Some a few hundred dollars maybe a month, some into the thousands. It's this relationship that I want to just spend a few moments with you on. You know, tithe is something, it's a, it's a number. God has told us, it's a percentage. That's pretty easy to calculate. But you know this thing called offerings? You know, that's between you and God now. See, you come up with the amount in your prayers to your Lord. So if there are any, and I hope there are not, but if there are any who haven't had the opportunity to really, really see how God blesses them, when they've entered into an agreement with their God on what they do with their money, I would invite you to consider a chapter in the book of Matthew. You've heard this before, and I'm just going to read it for you quickly. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what are we going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. Your Heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added. So my prayer this morning is that our priorities are straight as we return to our Lord and Savior, our tithes and our offerings. Will the deacons please come forward? Heavenly Father, we are here in your house because we love you. We're here because we want to learn more of you. We're here because we want to hear your word, we want to praise, we want to have fellowship. And Lord, we're here because we know that you love us more than we can possibly imagine. As we return our tithes and our offerings this morning, the offerings are slated for the Camelback Ministries that support this church, your ministries within this church. We pray that as our relationship grows with you, that you can do more for this church than we can possibly imagine. In Jesus' worthy name I pray, amen.
Happy Sabbath, everybody. Before I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker today, I'm so glad that I belong to a church that thinks about the community and backpacks for Christ. There was one other announcement that we didn't make this morning, but we have another chance to help our own community. We have a few families in our church who need a hand up this season. So as you leave today and are in the lobby, look at the information window. There's a little Christmas tree that will have little tags on it. And the tags can be anything from a gift card to blankets to clothing to children's toys. Uh, if you feel the need and to, to give to a member of our church this season, please pick one of those up. And I think we're going to have them back by the 19th. Is that correct? So there'll be a place to put the gifts on the 19th, and then they'll be uh, taken care of and delivered to those families. So, As you all know, in the end of June, Pastor White moved on to the conference to be the Ellen G. White lecturer for the Arizona conference. And since then, we have been looking for a new pastor. And we have a guest speaker here today who is a potential candidate. I'm going to embarrass him a little bit here. He doesn't know this. But he was actually one of the very first names that was presented to us by the Calhouns. Many of you know Lydia and Craig. Uh, I think finding a pastor, or maybe if you're a pastor looking at another church, is kind of like buying a new car. And at the time, Pastor Stanton didn't need a new car. <laughs> if you want to use that analogy, he, he had prayed about it and thought about it, and at that time, he was happy where he was. But I've been told by Lydia Calhoun that she has prayed every single day to make him feel uncomfortable about his decision. <laughs> so uh, apparently her prayers have been answered, and about three weeks ago, Pastor John Stanton contacted our ministerial secretary at the conference, uh, Mike Ortel, and asked if potentially if our situation was still in need of a pastor. And after multiple conversations and meetings, he has agreed to come and kick our tires and look under our hood. So, so. Uh, that was a quick little embarrassing story. I'm going to tell him another little embarrassing story. Uh, we ran into each other years ago when we were just reminiscing about this. He's a few years younger than me, I'm afraid to say, but we were at PUC together. He was uh, at the prep school and I was at PUC going to college. And um, there academy were involved in the college intramurals and I think we were both reminiscing that when we played against each other we won, you know, each of our teams won, but when you see John I'm sure you'll know who has the better memory, it's not me. So John and Rochelle, his wife, is Rochelle here? Can I embarrass you and have you stand? Because everybody's going to see John here in a second, let's give her a hand. Thank you. They are coming from Spokane, Washington, and Rochelle is a superintendent of education and oversees 27 schools. John is the personal evangelism and discipleship director of the Upper Columbia Conference. Prior to that, he's been a minister in Idaho, Illinois, and was a Bible worker in St. Louis, if I'm correct. Uh, they're both graduates of PUC, go pioneers. Uh, Pastor John is almost finished with his master's in divinity, he has a couple more classes. He enjoys sports, video, uh, a number of things to try to get all sorts of people involved in ministry. Rochelle is interested in music, and I think in his personal statement, you'll find that uh, his foundation is solid. He says that he has a strong dependence on Jesus through prayer and his devotional life. Spiritual gifts are prominent in his preaching, and he has a passion for the word, making truth clear and relevant to peoples of all generations. 
So Pastor John, please come forward and enjoy his talk on It's All About Who You Know. Thank you, Chris. I think his team won. <laughs> it is great to be with you here at Camelback. My wife and I have been reminiscing a little bit that we had been here 15 years ago. Uh, prior, I, I kind of was called to the ministry taking a very circuitous route, uh, being in the corporate world for about 15 years before I sensed God calling to ministry. And we spent time here in Phoenix, several of those years that I was in business, and in fact, attended this church. And always thought back then, wow, what a nice, wonderful church. And who, could, you know, who do you know? I mean, the, the Lord really has a, an interesting way of doing things sometimes, isn't it true? You know, we originally thought that maybe this was gonna be a bit of a challenging week to have me come out and speak because of the music program. But I'll tell you, we picked the best week to come out and speak. Because while I'm standing up here in hopes of blessing you, I have been blessed. And what a great, uh, talented and good looking group of people here. The other privilege I had too is the announcement of Sasaya, his wife, having a child. Sasaya, are you here today? Did Sasaya come out? There he is. Good to see you, buddy. Congratulations. Congratulations. I can't wait to, to meet everybody, the whole family. And uh, Sasaya's brother, Sione, and I are really good friends. But is my good friend, too. We spent a lot of time together up in the Napa Valley during our growing up years. So great to see you again. Should you, would you bow your heads with me? It doesn't, always, it doesn't hurt to pray too much, right? Amen. Father, we just invite your spirit to be here with us. Touch our heart and, and through this message, give each of us exactly what we need by speaking to our ear and drawing us close to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Music moves us. There's nothing quite like it. It gets into our heart and it moves our soul. It's almost like the Lord created music to speak to us in ways that maybe we wouldn't pay much attention to. Maria Von Trapp from the Von Trapp family, remember the old sound of music? She once said, music acts like a magic key to which the most tightly closed heart opens. And it's very true. There's nothing quite like music. I think that's one of the reasons why we put special music before the message from Sabbath to Sabbath. But there's something else that also moves the heart and that is stories. I can tell you very few sermons that I stood up in front or that I've listened to from people standing up in front that have not had some kind of moving story that has gone along with it. Stories tend to move beyond just the mind and it touches the heart, similar to the way that music does. In fact, the Bible says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being saved, but to us, it is what? The power of God. So the message of the cross is powerful. It's powerful. And I believe that the truths we hold as Seventh-day Adventist Christians are a blessing to us. But unless they move from mind to the heart and take root, that the power just isn't there. And so the foundation for my ministry and what I try to accomplish is, is allowing the Lord to move us, not just in mind, not just in thinking, although that's very important, but move us so our heart is touched and our lives are changed. Why am I talking about music and stories? Because I believe that each of these with the power to touch the heart will stimulate a response to us to God's wooing presence. And that is the one thing, these are the things that God wants to do in us as he seeks to revive his church to finish this work. Do you wanna go home? 
I want to go home. I wish we didn't have to be here. We could meet in heaven, just have a song service, right? But we're still here. And I believe the Lord is still the head of this church and has a plan for each and every one of us. Now we know that the heart is intuitively impacted by what we think about. We just know that. You know, in fact, when we say, I love you with all my heart, right? That we know that love does exist in the mind and that's what's generating in our connections and our, in our re- responding and, and acting between each other. But the heart somehow we find is involved in these kinds of things. And and what I've been reading about here lately is kind of interesting. There's some new research called neurocardiology. Neurocardiology. How many physicians do we have in here? Maybe some of you have, have heard about some of this research. It's very interesting. What they're discovering is that the heart is more than a pump for the body's circulatory system. It's a sophisticated sensory organ that receives and processes information. The nervous system within the heart, or this heart brain they call it, enables us to learn, remember, and make functional decisions apart from the cranial brain. In fact, the heart sends far more signals to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. In fact, even experiments are demonstrating that these signals influence our perception, our cognition, and our emotional processing. Something's going on in here, this wonderfully created heart, then we give it credit for. Now we also know the Bible tells us that the heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Now we've read that verse many times. But I want to say this, nowhere in the Bible will you find this description of the converted heart. You see, God wants to take our heart and he wants to change it. He just doesn't want to speak to us here. He doesn't want to call us and have us recognize the calling that he has in our lives to acknowledge that he exists and then to acknowledge that he has some plan for us. He wants this to come down deep to grab a hold of our soul and to let us know that he has a change in store for us that will make us radically different. And what I found from time to time is that it's dangerous to just function at a mental or intellectual level. If you don't let things come from here, we miss on truly, I think, the relationship, the salvation and spiritual relationship we have with God. Proverbs 2, well, actually, I skipped a verse. John 7, 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow living water. There's a converted heart there. And so we know then the heart is essential to our salvation, our spiritual experience with God, which is why Paul can proclaim that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I'm in the capacity of um, personal evangelism and discipleship for the Upper Columbia Conference. And I think this is kind of where the rubber meets the road stuff. We have a network of Bible workers placed in churches doing evangelistic work, some door-to-door work, yes, but a lot of equipping and training in churches and just engaging and empowering members for ministry, and I'm excited about that. But one of the things we learn and we teach very early on, especially for Bible workers and for anybody who seeks to get out into the the lives of their neighbors and friends to share the gospel, is that our our success does not depend so much on our knowledge and accomplishments. Our success in the work depends upon your ability to find your way to the heart of another. When you go into the home of someone and you sit down to read the scriptures with them, when you pray for them, it's more about what you're trying to do to reach the heart than it is what you're trying to do to present a system of truths to them. Now, those truths are essential. We were Seventh-day Adventists because of what we believe the Bible teaches about God and many things. But let me tell you, the heart is everything to Jesus because if we cannot give of our heart, he doesn't have us. 
Now, what I'm not saying is that you should follow your heart without using your mind. Just follow your heart. You hear that from time to time. <laughs> That's dangerous. That's dangerous, young people, dangerous. <laughs> oh. We need to be careful not to follow our heart blindly, but at the same time, we need to be careful not to at least listen to our heart and what it's telling us as our mind contemplates and thinks about the goodness of God and who God is and the plan that God has for our lives and the decisions we make from day to day. Proverbs 2, verses 10 to 12 says this, when wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you and understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil. And what I've found is I've, I've especially Proverbs and Ecclesiastes has a lot to say about the heart and the mind and knowledge and wisdom. What I found consistently throughout these verses, these scriptures, and Jesus alludes to them many times as well using the same kind of language is that knowledge, the word knowledge, it seems to be ascribed mostly to what's going on in here. But wisdom is ascribed to what's going on in here. In fact, when God put wisdom into Solomon, the king, it says specifically that he put wisdom into his heart, into his heart. So you almost get this equation Knowledge, head, plus wisdom, heart, equals understanding, discretion, discernment about the reality of things around us. You know, one of the things that I think is challenging to the church today, we've had some of this experience up in, in, in Washington, and I'm sure that it's not, you're not immune to it here, it's everywhere, is those that ascribe to a specific brand or aspect of the gospel that mentally they arrive at, they conclude with, and that's all they know. That's what they preach, that's what they teach. And unless you accept their understanding of it, then you're just not quite Christian or Adventist enough. Have you run into anybody like that? I mean, I, or am I speaking to, yeah, it's a challenge. And I think predominantly what we find is that they're speaking with their, their brain. But the difference between knowledge and wisdom, do you know that difference? Knowledge is what's here, but what is wisdom? The application of that knowledge, knowing how to use it, is key to the things of life. The brain and heart must be in balance. And I think what the scripture is telling us is that both the mind and heart are essential to a healthy spiritual life. You know, we've, uh, I think, are kind of moving into some new territory in some of these areas in the scientific field. And one of the things that was emphasized just 40, 50 years ago, mostly, was IQ. If you had a high IQ, you had a great capacity for, for doing wonderful things. Uh, I've never had my IQ tested. Um, don't think I, I wanna have my IQ tested. <laughs> Sometimes they're better just you not knowing, right? But nowadays, the focus isn't as much on IQ as it is something else. Have you heard of EQ? Emotional intelligence. It's a quotient that doesn't just address the mind and our ability to think and process things intellectually, but how we deal with as people, and I think we're talking about the heart here, how the heart and mind are in balance and we deal with our emotions and the things that we affect and that affect us. This healthy balance between mind and heart is this emotional intelligence that it speaks about. And I believe the Lord wants us to have that, amen? He wants us to be open to each other and mature in our relationships and our walk with him and, and be able to stand and say that we truly not only understand intellectually, but our heart is united with God and with each other. Now, I know that my time is somewhat short. Wasn't sure exactly how much time I had, so I'm gonna skip a couple things. But that's okay. Because I wanna get to the heart of this whole issue. And that is the one thing that I believe has the power 
to bring the mind and heart in balance and to touch the heart and, and remove barriers between that and between each other like nothing else. And that's relationships. Good, loving relationships. In fact, I think some experts right now are attributing some of the breakdown in our society with a bit of, tr of a shift from relational interactions to ideology. And we're finding that to a great degree, even with the terrorism things going on and some of the horrible um, stuff that's happening today. But what we find in the first chapter of the Bible is, is that God is this Elohim, God. He's a powerful God. He speaks things into existence. At a word, he creates. He's a God to be honored and respected, even feared. But then when we move into chapter two, which is a continuation of the creation account, it's not just Elohim. What we find here is Yahweh Elohim, which is that it says the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Not just God, but the Lord God. What's happening here in this transition from chapter one to chapter two? Finally, God has a name. We find the relational aspect of God coming into play. In fact, turn next to the person next to you and just say their name. Go ahead, just turn next to them and say their name. I don't know why we chuckle when we do that, isn't it? The reason I want you to do that is, let me tell you something. You're, when you hear your name being said by something else, something changes. Isn't that true? When I say Rochelle, there's a, honestly a bond, a bond begins there. Something's going on that wouldn't if I just said, hi. So chapter one, we're meeting, whoa, God. But in chapter two, Yahweh, God has a name, the Lord, God. And then he does something unique. He gets down, creates out of the mud a body for Adam, and then he breathes into Adam the breath of life. And Adam wakes up, and what does Adam see? First off, not just Elohim, but Yahweh, Elohim, the Lord, is there. Not only does this God have a name, he wants to create people for relationships. He wants to look them in the eye and he wants to spend time with them. I'm gonna show you a few pictures of my past. Just, I'll just go through a few pictures here and I'll say a few things about this. I kind of went GQ or kind of GQ for a while there, got a little blonde hair, I don't know what I was thinking. But <laughs> that's us on our honeymoon. That's a reunion a few years ago. This is a recent game. Sasaya, here's your brother. That's Josiah's brother right there, Sioni. Now I show you these pictures and you say, they seem like nice people, but it doesn't do anything in here, does it? When I look at those pictures, everything is here. And why is that? Because I have a relationship with them. I have experiences with them. Friends, this is what church is about. Are we really expecting to get to know each other when we get to heaven finally? Or isn't this the place to spend time together, to look each other in the eye, to, 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 to bond heart to heart and to love each other? Not just because we intellectually agree on the same set of doctrines, but because something is going on beyond just what we believe about what the Bible says. Something's going on with God in our lives and we fulfill the commandments that way. What is the greatest commandment? That we love the Lord God with all our heart, mind, and soul, right? And does it finish there? And our neighbors? Relationships aren't just vertical, they're horizontal.
If the fall of mankind into sin resulted in a breakdown of our relationship with God, which it did, then it makes sense to me that salvation occurs through the repair of that relationship. So the question I need to ask myself each and every day is this. Am I not... Not that am I doing the right things or am I believing the right things, but am I spending enough quality time with Jesus? Do I seek and enjoy his company more than anything else? Because I think if we're there, if we're spending that time with with Jesus every day, that all the other stuff will take care of itself. Are you with me? Even Jesus said about his father that this is eternal life that they may know you. That word know we know in the Bible is an intimate word. It's a relational word. Which is why I think for the first time I'm beginning a little bit to understand our new covenant experience in Christ. And I'm beginning to close here with this last text. We've read this before, but I want you to see it from a little different perspective today. For this is the covenant that I will create with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and I will write them on their hearts. There's balance there. And I will be their God and they will be my people, relational. And then this text, this verse 11 appears out of the middle of nowhere, almost like it doesn't belong. But now in this context, we know it does belong where it says, None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord. Because what? They all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. A knowledge of God is an intimate relationship with God and that relationship with God affects our relationships here. So I'm gonna end with a story. Will you give me a little latitude for a few minute story? Remember stories are powerful. a guy named Joe. And because this is a parable doesn't mean it's entirely theological. But this man named Joe, when he came to the, finally to the gates of that city, and he was met by his guardian angel. And his guardian angel said to Joe, Joe, it's great to see you. I'm so glad that you're done with that struggle there on earth. What would you like to do? What would you like to see in heaven? Joe thought about it for a while, for a minute, and he said, you know, I want to go see my home in the city. I heard that Jesus prepared a place for me. I want to go see my home. Angel said, sure, let's go. So the angel took Joe off, and they went to see the home, and Joe's eyes are wide, and he's looking in the home, and he's thinking, wow, this is fantastic. It's big. It's amazing. But then the angel was sure he saw a little bit of his face drop, Joe's face drop, and he said, Joe, is there a problem? He said, well, you know, maybe I'm missing it, but where's the TV? (laughs) The angel said, well, we don't have TVs up here. There's lots of other things to do. And Joe said, well, you know, I I love going to church. I love seeing my church family. I, I, I like to read the Bible. But what happens on Saturday night? So the angel wrote down, Joe would like to have a TV in his room in his house. And after a few other things that maybe Joe made some notes on, how about a little bigger fire mantle and some other things in the house? Angel wrote them down. They leave the home and, and he said, well, do you, what would you like to see next? How about we can go to the Garden of Eden? And, and Joe said, flowers? Flowers? Well, I like flowers, okay, but I, I don't, is there another home? I heard there was another home. So he went to see his other home. And the same thing happens there. He's looking around the home and he's not quite completely satisfied. But sure enough, he writes those things down. And as he's leaving the home, he looks out across the the front yard and he says, he stops the angel. He said, is that Bob? And he just said, yeah, Bob's your next door neighbor. I couldn't stand that guy. He drove me nuts in church. He would go on and on during board meetings. I got to live next to him forever. Angel writes down, Joe doesn't want to live next to Bob. So they're flying back to the city and uh, the angel knows that Joe is not so happy. And he said, maybe Joe, maybe this isn't the place that you want to be. 
Maybe this is just heaven isn't a place you'll, you'll enjoy. And Joe's response was, you know what? This is a great place. I can learn to love it. But then those, those famous words, we've heard them before, that this earth, the time on earth, that's what the time is for, to get ready for heaven. Fast forward to Angela, who comes to the gates of the city and meets her guardian angel. And her guardian angel says, Angela, it's great to have you here. What would you like to do first? We could go to the Garden of Eden. We can see flowers thinking, hey, this is a woman. She's going to love flowers. But Angela said, no, no. Take me to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. And as the angel brought Angela before Jesus and began to make those introductions, Jesus stopped the introduction right there. And he says to the angel, don't worry, Angela and I have already met. You see, the question is often asked, who is it that's gonna be caught up with Jesus when he comes? And my answer, my response to that would be, those who are caught up with Jesus now. It's been so nice to be able to be here today and worship with you. And I'm so thankful that we were able to share this program with you. And I'm thankful for the Camelback Church that they could have just bumped us off and said, we can get you another time because you're right here. 
and we were able to blend the service. We're going to close off the service with one final number by Abelamenti. It's, I mean, we have to play it on bells at Christmas time because it is the famous Ukrainian carol, Carol of the Bells. Um, while they're getting set up, because we were going to do another one too, but it's time. And um, so we'll end with this. I would like to, for those who don't know, introduce my partner in the music department at Thunderbird. Um, we work so well together. Susan, would you please stand? Susan Byers. She, she conducts the band, the string orchestra, the other handbell choir, um, teaches some private lessons, and teaches two sophomore, sections of sophomore English as well. And it's just so much fun to be able to be here and work with her and share the department. We want to invite you to two very special programs this next weekend. Friday night, um, we have a, a Christmas drama that the choir is going to do and um, would love to have you there called Never the Same. It looks at different characters that were involved in the birth of Christ and how as a result of their involvement they will never be the same again. And then Saturday night we have our big splash spectacular Christmas program with all the groups in the music department and lots of fun Christmas music. We'd love to see you at both of those. So again, thank you for inviting us to share our music with you today and we'll end the service today with the Carol of the Bells.
much for your presence that was with us here this morning. And as we leave this place, Father, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will continue to be with us and speaking to our hearts and bringing close to home how the bottom line truly is who we know. And we thank you so much that you have revealed yourself to us and we know you as our God, as our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.